It's really fucked up to have a blind guy, isn't it? Just because he's blind don't mean he's a saint, bro. Really fucked up. Hello and welcome to episode 129 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemirov, and here are my co-hosts, Chris Pachko and Angie Han. Hey, everybody. Hello. So, this week's lineup has a hot topic and then a full review. Our hot topic is going to be the news that there is a short list for the director of Captain Marvel, and then we're going to launch into our full review, which is going to be of Don't Breathe. So, first up, hot topic. Christy, you got it, right? Yeah, so Captain Marvel is going to be the MCU's first female-fronted superhero movie. And today, the Hollywood Reporter revealed that the three women that are at the top of consideration for the directing job, Marvel previously said that this was a big thing that they wanted to bring a female director in, are Leslie Linka Glatter, Nikki Cairo, and Lorene Scafaria. I'm sorry if I mispronounced anyone's names. I should have thought to look that up before we started recording. It didn't happen. So um, here's a rundown of those talent really quickly. Nikki Cairo came out of the box with Whale Rider, which was an amazing movie in the early 2000s. You should absolutely look up. Since then, she's done North Country, McFarland, USA, and she has The Zookeeper's Wife coming up. She's really known for drama uh, that has like a really humane element to it. Uh, Leslie Linka Gladder, I'm less familiar with. She's done a lot of TV directing. She's done Homeland, Ray Donovan, The Newsroom, True Blood, Mad Men, ER, and The West Wing. I would like to say she did direct. She her the movie that she's known for having directed is Now and Then, the 1990s childhood classic. Why was that not their lead? That's amazing. Because she's mostly known for TV nowadays. That's incredible. That makes that I'm like weirdly like specially rooting for her because I watched that movie infinity times. Infinity times. Uh, and then yeah, Lorraine Scafaria. Um, she wrote Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, and then wrote and directed Seeking a Friend at the End of the World and The Meddler. Um, and so. None of these people have done things where you necessarily go like, oh, well, obviously Captain Marvel next. Though I'd argue that Le- that Linka Gladder has a good shot because she's actually done some military type stories before. I would say um, that uh, I would actually say that Marvel often picks directors that don't seem obvious. Like Thor Ragnar is being directed by Taika Waititi. Um, Joe and Anthony Russo, who are kind of the stewards of the Marvel Universe now, like, you know, they directed Captain America. But before that, they were known for directing, like, Community and Arrested Development. So they actually have a long history of picking unexpected choices. Yeah, I think I'm excited mostly because this is a list of very fresh names to me. I, I think it's because I don't necessarily associate them with being the directors of a big, gigantic superhero movie. Then again, the natural reaction to that is going to be less excitement than let's say if Jennifer Kent the director of the Babadook had gotten the job and then I would have been over the moon about it but not that I'm not excited for any of these women to get behind the lens of the movie it's just that because I am a little less familiar with their work I mean I've seen a number of films listed here it's just none of them None of them are movies that I've watched over and over where I'm that confident in what they're going to do. Perry mentions Jennifer Kent because Jennifer Kent was rumored to have been in early discussions for this, but is supposedly no longer in talks. And she's actually working on a different movie that's a biopic about an American murder trial from like the 19, I want to say 13 or something like that. I forget. It's been a while. But um, I actually don't want Jennifer Kent Kent to direct this movie because while I would love her to get a bigger budget, I kind of want to see what she does as like kind of taking her own path and making her own movies before she gets forced like foisted into like a marvel machine like i'd like to see her do something like that eventually but not just yet i, um, I feel and- like that with the because because these it, that's not unique to captain marvel or even the marvel cinematic universe because that's kind of like ha- like that's what happens these days is if you're a director that's like on your way up or that would like to take your next step up this like you get scooped up a lot of times by these giant franchises and I feel the same way about, like, you know, I feel the same way about, I would feel the same way if Jennifer Kent got it, but I felt the same way, for example, when, like, Ryan Johnson got tabbed for one of the Star Wars movies, and I was just like, you know, I'm excited, but at the same time, I'm disappointed that he's going to be, it's going to take time away from something he would have done that would have been more uniquely his. But notably, he had already made several of his own original movies yet, and it's not that I don't think Kent could handle something bigger, it's that I'd like to see her kind of form her voice and get more of her own stuff out there before we before she gets some before she chooses to do something bigger you know but like i i I think these choices are potentially really exciting uh and you know i'm i'm excited that marvel seems to be really dedicated to having this be a story like about women and by women and for women because also the women who wrote the screenplay are guardians of the galaxies nicole perlman and inside outs meg lafave and that's a really dynamic team like you know uh 
there wouldn't have been a Guardians of the Galaxy if it weren't for Nicole Perlman's work getting that that property together. I think it's great that Marvel is very determined to get a female director for their female superhero movie. Just like I was really excited that they specifically tried to find a black director for their black superhero movie. At the same time, though, part of me is like, so we have to wait to like for non-white leads to get these jobs and i mean in their defense they hired taika waititi for thor ragnarok so clearly it's not like they're like it's not like i'm not saying that they're ruling out black or female directors but it's just it it, you know i i hope i'm glad that they're taking this step but i hope it doesn't end here i hope i hope they're thinking from now on isn't just well you know we don't have to deal with any more female directors until we make captain marvel 2 i agree i absolutely agree with that i like that this is if this is the thing that gets them in the door to pay attention to female directors, I'll take it. Uh, but I'm hoping, yeah, it doesn't stop here and this becomes some sort of sense of, like, tokenism. We should wrap up, but before we go, any of you guys have a favorite, uh, whether it's one of these directors or someone else that hasn't been named? I don't. I honestly don't know enough about Captain Marvel as a character. Like, I dig her mohawk, but, like, I don't know enough about her to really be able to make a jump on that. Yeah, Jennifer Kent was the name, obviously, that I was most excited about, but... I'd be. Ha- I don't really care. I'm happy with all three of these. They all sound pretty good to me. So, rah rah, rah female directors getting behind a Captain Marvel movie starring Brie Larson with these two right. I think the writers and Brie Larson at this point are what I'm so super excited about. But I will be happy for any of these ladies to get the gig. I would, and also just when Marvel locks onto a director, they lock on because the director has a really solid pitch for the way they want to tell a story. So I think whoever they pick will will have reason to be excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that is a wrap on our hot topic, and now we are going to move over to our review of the movie Don't Breathe. Here is the IMDb synopsis. A group of friends break into the house of a wealthy blind man thinking they'll get away with the perfect heist. They're wrong. Yes, IMDb, you nailed it. That is what the movie's about. It's It stars uh, Jane Levy, who was in Fede Alvarez's feature directorial debut, which was 2013's Evil Dead remake. And she is joined by Dylan Minnette and Daniel Zavato. And the three of them play these kids who are kind of bad kids. And they rob houses because one of their fathers owns a security company. And they take the keys, they go and rob, and then they leave. She, <laughs> do is acting like a Looney Tune, she wants to get away and move to California and have a better life with her little sister. So they decide to up their game for this next robbery. And that's why they target this blind man who is sitting on a significant sum of money. So they break in, excuse me, thinking that it will be an easy job. And it is not because this blind man is Stephen Lang and he is just a thing of nightmares. He is so incredible insanely creepy in this movie it's such a wonderful physical performance that is further enhanced by brilliant cinematography Fede Alvarez makes me more excited than just about any director out there right now especially for the horror genre I really do think he is one of the best budding horror filmmakers out there he is just so incredibly precise with every single thing he does and in this movie in particular Really cool thing about this movie is the whole thing that Stephen Lang's character is blind and putting the other characters in a situation where they are actually at a deficit because he is blind and he has he's enhanced his other senses and the camera moves around the blind man's house in a way that really enhances that big time and it's just the way the camera pans from let's say one character to the next and then another room to another room and it's just the score drops out at just the right time for a stinger to come in and really catch you off guard and oh my i really cannot say enough good things about this movie i'm so excited about it i've seen it twice now and it gets better the second time for sure Before I get too carried away saying too many good things about this movie, I will let you guys jump in. So, I hated it. Ooh, this is going to be interesting. I, like, I genuinely... Okay, so I know Perry saw it at South By. I'm pretty sure I know why you hated it. I'll just put that out there now. Here's what I'm going to say. Because it didn't scare the shit out of me at all. I thought it was so boring. And I don't understand. Everyone's talking about how masterfully it was made. And I feel like it's so hackneyed. I don't understand. I'm completely astonished. Okay, that's not what I expected you to say at all. 
here's the thing. Okay, this is so, this is one of the most beautiful horror movies I've seen since I hard his Evil disagree. Dead. I find like okay, so there's like a shot in the in the, very early in the movie when they first break into the house, and this isn't a spoiler because this is just like literally the first thing that happens where they try to give you the very basic geography of the house by this long CGI enhanced <gasps> shot, and it's so CGI enhanced like, shot. Absolutely. When it goes under the bed and stuff, that's CGI. That's not oh, a real thing. Oh, oh. Um, I'm, anyway. thinking, I'm thinking of a different shot right after they come in and you move from room to room with the, with one character, passing it off to the other, and then you finish. Same yeah, shot. that was a really good shot. It's I thought, shot. I thought it, it was goes under the bed fantastic. The but here's the thing. Anyway. When they're doing that and they're like, and I get it, it's supposed to be kind of cool where you have this heightened idea of like, you know the house better than they do, so we're kind of in between what they know and what the blind man knows. And I get that. And I think that's potentially interesting, but there's like close ups in that sequence. So you're just starting this like adventure with them where it's like, here's a weapon, here's a weapon, here's a skylight. And it's just telegraphing so hard. Like this is stuff that's going to be important later. And like, not in a casual way at all. It felt so pronounced to me that I thought it was really annoying. And then like the movie itself goes, (laughs) it starts off like it's going to be this grounded movie where it's like, here are these kids and like, they're going to do something bad, but like they really, need to because Detroit is dying and this girl needs to get her sister out and they try to make it like a grounded situation but then as soon as you meet the blind man it's this nonsense superpower thing where like he can sniff out the sneakers from rooms away I just, his it, senses he are high he li- he, his other sentence, senses are heightened because he I know because he's an evil blind man Okay, oh, Christy, you're so making it ridiculous. sound like he's evil wow. daredevil I wouldn't go that far uh, I mean I, I think that I I agree that they exaggerate his abilities, but I think that, you know, within the context of this movie, like, I d- it didn't start, like, I know what you mean about it started it started out feeling a little bit more grounded. The dude even- is ex-military. How do they exaggerate his abilities? He's, he's Why can ex- he smell sneakers he's, from, like, four rooms because away? Because, because he's blind. Four he's rooms blind. Away. He his other senses he's, like, right are enhanced. He's been living in that house, holed up for God knows how has long. To stink! That house is gross as hell. Okay, I'm, like, sure, I'm sure the house the I'm sure the house stinks, but I 110% bought the fact that he could smell stinky sneakers in his kitchen, and I 110% bought the fact that he can maneuver around that house a million times quicker than anyone else because he's been living there and he's had to figure out all that, that stuff. That aspect I could potentially buy, but then also they should have figured that out enough to be able to just move things in the house enough to throw him off and they never attempt that like no one ever tries to be like if i put a chair here he's fucked like that never like it's the most obvious thing to try to do but that's super nitpicky my issue with this movie well, not is- really because because there's a point where something in the house is not the same as it was before and it tips him off to where they are yeah, but so that, at that, that point, same they are, tactic like, could work against them as well i'm them. sorry i feel like i'm already yelling at the computer i must take a deep breath no, I know. I like I was bummed because okay, so I know you thought really highly of this. I know our friend and friend of the show, Matt Donato, thought really highly of this. As Angie and I went to see it, they had a big poster that had Filmmaker magazine calling it the best horror movie in twenty years. And then I sat there and I jumped at the very first jump scare. And then after that it's so many jump scares that I was like not scared. The tension did not work for me. And I just I think Fede Alvarez, I just don't get it. His brand of horror does nothing for me. I get that it's mean spirited, I get that it's gruesome. But, like, it Means. doesn't scare me. I didn't find that even that scary either. I just thought it was gross. Like, uh, it's my turn to say I'm sad this is not a video podcast anymore because you guys should have seen <laughs> Perry just, like, literally face palmed and was just like, no. <laughs> Perry just, literally was no. just the scream poster. Like, oh. n- not the movie, but the painting, rather. It was a, it was a double face palm. Yeah. Oh, you're stressing me out, Kay. <laughs> All right. I'm somewhere in between. Like, I, but I actually, like, I liked it quite a bit. I thought it was really well done. I'm kind of with Christy in that this isn't necessarily my first, like, this isn't necessarily, like, my cup of tea. It's not the kind of movie that I would, that I'm like, I love these kinds of movies. But I, like, I'm with Perry. I thought it was really well done. It, I, I remember, like, watching kind of the early scenes and being like, this is, like, really beautifully shot for, you know, especially for, like, just, I was expecting just like kind of a random horror movie because I didn't see his first film. I thought it was beautifully shot. I was I was really impressed by that long take that you guys that you that you guys apparently have super different opinions on. Um, and I, I mean, I don't. I'm not gonna get. It. I don't. I don't want to start the fight again about whether the guy is has superpowers. I wouldn't say that. I think Christy. I think that you're exaggerating how much he's supposed to do. Uh, how much he's able to do. But uh, yeah, like I mean, I I bought it enough 
while I was watching the movie that it didn't bother me. And I do think that the movie does some clever things with it. Like, you know, like it, you would think that this would slow him down, but you see the ways that it kind of, the, he m- manipulates the situation so that it kind of works in his favor. <sighs> Man, I'm just so disappointed right now. I'm just, I'm so sad that you can't love this movie as much as I did. There are just so I many. I like that sh- you can't even acknowledge that I don't like it. You're like you can't love it as much as I. Like I hated this. I never want to watch this again. Oh man, have you ever seen his Evil Dead movie? Yeah, I thought it was boring. I thought it's gross, but it's not scary to me. Oh wow. I okay. There are two very different kinds of scares. That one is much more a gore show and trying to mm-hmm. scare you in that sense. But in this one, every this time there's is way gore, more they slow mo it to like be like, "Look at the gore! Oh God!" And there's like, ugh, oh, I th- th- see. I think that kind of stuff works really well. Like one of the shots that you were referring to earlier, the long tracking shot. Just the the point in that tracking shot where. Dylan Minnette ducks out of frame, they push it on the axe and pull back out and he pops back up. Yes, it's telegraphing something, but at the same time, there's something about that that's so beautiful and about the camera movement that kind of pulls you in and envelops you in this house and makes you feel like you're trapped inside with them. It's, I I don't understand how you didn't get that from it. I, here's the thing, this year we saw, and we should go into spoilers soon if we're going to do spoilers, but this year we saw two other like home invasion trapped in a house type movies with 10 Cloverfield Lane and uh, Green Room. And I thought both of those were great. And both of those, the tension worked really well for me. And I felt connected to the characters and terrified for them and, and entrenched in what they were going through. And in this, I felt nothing. And I actually just started getting actively annoyed because I feel like where those films, the per- the, per- the people came up with like a clear plot of how they were going to try to get out. And then we had to watch them try to succeed or fail at that. This was like the t- these 20 somethings or whatever, are always trying to figure out a new method to get out. And it just felt so meandering to me to the point where when the movie just wouldn't end, I was getting actively annoyed. You crazy. One of my favorite things about this movie is that You know the horror cliche where, why would you run up the stairs? Every single time they went from one place in the house to another, it was always so well motivated. And obviously they had to keep trying to find the the way out because it's like a trap. The blind man has a trap for them. He's ready for this. And I love that beginning thing where he kind of, you know, goes throughout the house and shows you all of the ways that they can't get out. It makes it so much more intense. I feel like Christy makes it sound like they had a lot of time to stand around, like, talking to each other and planning stuff. And I just... there are a I lot of like the... moony looks between the douchey nice boy and like like Dylan Nuts. Like, there are a lot of moony so looks cute. when they're trying to be silent so that and I, the guy won't come and after them. Also they talk a lot such, for being silent. They're also such great performances. I mean, really, Dylan Minnette and Jane Levy need a lot of credit for this movie because so much of, of them showing that they're terrified comes not through dialogue, being like, oh my god, I'm so scared. It's the look on their face. And I 110% bought it every single time they did it. All right, let's go into spoilers. <sighs> I'm out of breath. <laughs> Perry is so tired right now. I am. I am. This is <laughs> you're taking a lot out of me right now. Here's the thing. So then the spoilers annoyed me on another point wait, wait, because wait, like of course spoilers. Okay, now. wait, wait. So we're, we're we're talking spoilers now. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Okay, spoilers. Yeah, big spoilers. So please stop listening if you have not seen Don't Breathe, and yeah, come back later because big spoilers while we're discussing. Go for it, okay? So then the whole thing where it's like okay. It's okay that they were going to rob him because he's a super weird, gross, kidnapper, rapist, murder man. Like, fuck that. That was so tedious. How much oh. better do you think you would have enjoyed this movie if you liked the characters more? Because it sounds like a lot of what your problems... It sounds like a lot of the problem for you was that you just really, like, started out disliking the characters. It's not even that I didn't like them. It's that I didn't give a shit about them. Like, that's different. Like, I, I wasn't connected to their story at all because it's so ham-fisted that it's like, get it? Rocky was abused as a child and also her sister and also tattoos because she's sad and I was just like okay like it it didn't it didn't make it was so ham-fisted that it was just like I had no actual connection with these characters I almost like money because at least he was entertaining but like whiny pissy Dylan Minnette's character like why the fuck did they think they could just keep robbing houses for his dad like that didn't even make sense plot wise like no one's gonna figure that out are these people not realizing they're being robbed like it didn't make any fucking sense like wouldn't you immediately call the security company and be like hey i got robbed and nothing got set off but it did get set off that's why in the beginning he throws the rock through the glass so that the alarm goes off 
And I so guess. it's not but like the, his dad system failed. But don't you think there'd be like someone would start being like, oh, it's only houses with this system that are getting robbed? Perhaps so it would get perhaps it would get to that bottles? point eventually. But but still they're they're kids. I totally bought the fact that these kids are they would though, think, I have no idea how old they were supposed to be, or even if that was her sister or her, her daughter. I thought that like the details were really kind of wishy. Well, I definitely didn't get the I don't know their specific age, but I most certainly didn't get the impression that it was her daughter. I just based on the interaction with her and okay, her mother. Okay, I couldn't tell, and... but let's actually go into spoilers All because right. you guys haven't actually said any of the spoilers that we went. Yeah, into okay. So to the whole about. thing where it's revealed that like the girl who killed his daughter is like now in the basement and he raped her so that he could like have her, she could have his baby. Like it was like all of a sudden we just spun into a completely different genre. Also with the whole, and I didn't want to get into this with before spoilers, but also talking about the idea that he's basically super powered. It dives hard into the slasher thing where he's effectively Michael Myers, where no matter what they do, he can rebound. It just drove me crazy. It, it's like the film just. Kind deciding and now i'm this movie and i just couldn't follow that oh my god i don't agree with that I, at all i don't agree with that at all I, either. I, I think the tone of this movie is just so consistent throughout and it's it works so well because the visuals are so consistent throughout he creates a very concrete visual style at the beginning of the movie which almost lets him do whatever he wants and it works because it's upping the tension and upping the stakes every single time just when you think this movie can't get crazier and their situation can't get shittier Holy crap, look what's in the basement. That is the most insane, twisted idea ever, and he makes it work, and it's really messed up, and I kind of am fascinated by it. Hard to disagree. It's so, I don't know. Clearly, we're not going to reach any common ground here. No. Um, No. And wait, just just to talk about more spoilers, because I love these moments. When she crawls up into the crawl space and the dog comes in, oh my god, every... Both times I saw that, it didn't even matter that I knew she got out. I was freaking out in my seat. That is just the most... I actually thought the dog did not look scary in that sequence, and I thought it was ridiculous. Like, even though it's a big hulking dog, he looks like he's just excited to chase a ball or something. It didn't look scary to me. I just, this movie does nothing for me. What movie did you see? So, like, the dog can't even act now. I, I didn't say that the oh people can't God. act. I said that they didn't, like, it does, this movie doesn't scare me. Like, it's just as simple as, like, I don't find it scary. I thought it was really tedious. I am actually in a sweat right now. <laughs> I don't think I've ever sweat during the show. <sighs> <sighs> Perry's, like, literally throwing herself around in her seat. She's so infuriated <laughs> with me right now. Because it's, it's just, like, especially, I guess I, I'm taking this a little too personally because at this point, I'm wrestling with the fact with I don't know if this is my favorite movie of the year so far or if Green Room is. I love them both so much and there is no doubt in my mind that I will, I probably will see Don't Breathe Again in theaters and then I'm going to own it and I'm going to abuse that digital copy or that Blu-ray, whatever I get my hands on first. Wow. See, I really loved Green Room. This just, whatever. I felt like this was trying so hard to do what Green Room did and I don't understand why it's getting more attention than I think Green Room got. So Christy, two thumbs up, right? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say this. A lot of people that were in the theater we were in were like hooting and hollering and laughing and whatever, seeming to have a hell of a time with this. I just think it's too fucking goofy. Like, it's gruesome and yeah, and it's mean spirit and whatever. It did nothing for me. I think it's goofy so is ludicrous. the last word I would ever use to describe this you movie. You should have seen our audience. They were going like they were going nuts because it's just it's such a goofy movie because it's like, you I know, I think oh, that the reaction the was of- that it was goofy. Like, I didn't get the impression that these people were like having a good time because they're like, what a stupid movie. Like, I got the impression that like, you know, when you go to a horror movie, a lot of times the audience will be laughing because it's a way to relieve the tension and it was really tense like i thought yeah, that people were enjoying it that's exactly the same thing that happened in my theater both at south by and last night when i went to see mm. it again by the way because- chrissy and i were in the same audience we just apparently have vastly different reads of what the audience reaction was but i, uh, I guess but opinion, every like- everyone in my theater was having an audible reaction because it was that kind of, that perfect, you know, communal horror experience reaction where something crazy happens and you you are all on the edge of your seat gripping your armrest and then the thing finally ends and you're all like, ah, and you like tap the person next to you, that was crazy. And then something else happens, you get excited all over again. This movie is just relentless and it doesn't let up. I I just can't believe that you found it boring. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we should wrap up. So final opinions, three Three words or less. Most overrated of the year. That's, that was not you, three you words lose. or less, Christy. Now who can't you fucking lose. plan ahead? This I don't like the three word thing. All right. 
That was just arbitrary because I just wanted it. I, I felt like we. I felt like you guys were gonna argue for like the rest of the evening. Yes, I am. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm gonna crawl through the computer. I, I have rings in my head right Very now. So that that I was like, to kick why my are ass. we talking about the ring now? <laughs> okay, well, clearly I freaking love this movie. I can't endorse it more. Please go see it and prove Christy wrong. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, my opinion is not as exciting because it's not as strong as either of yours. But I think it, I think it's really well done. I think if you like horror movies, then this is definitely one worth checking out. Um, yeah. So... Well, all right. So, yeah, before my head explodes or I pop a blood vessel, that is a wrap on episode 129 of Popcorn and Prosecco. You know where to find us. Go on iTunes where you can rate and subscribe and leave comments and all that good stuff. We have our website, popcornprosecco.com. Please like us on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter at Popcorn Prosecco. And then all three of us are all over the Internet as well. Christy, do you want to take it first? Sure. You can find me on Twitter at Christy Puchko. That's K-R-I-S-D-Y-P-U-C-H-K-O. Feel free to find me and yell at me if you like this movie, whatever. And if you didn't, <laughs> join the team. Uh, and you can find my career highlights at DecadentCriminals.com. Angie? You can find me on Twitter at A-J-H-A-N. And I am, my work is on SlashFilm.com. And you can find my work on the Collider Videos YouTube channel, Collider.com. And you can catch me on Twitter, probably yelling at Christy, at P. Nemiroff. So <laughs> I will never let this go. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Well, this has been a good last episode for Popcorn and Prosecco, because clearly we're never talking to each other again. Please let me go. Leave me. Fucked up. <laughs>